Hey, hey there, YouTube. Baylor here, and today I want to talk about bosses. Not your boss at work, rather, the bosses of Slay the Spire. Numbering only 10, actually. These bosses still main uh, still create the most difficult challenges of any given run of Slay the Spire, and they're going to be your most challenging opponents on any given run with any character. You fight randomly one of three bosses each in Act 1, 2, and 3, and then usually I'm looking to always fight the Corrupt Heart in Act 4 as well. So a usual run for me of Slay the Spire counters four of these bosses on any given go. What we're going to be doing here today is talking about each of the bosses, their strategy, how to counter what they do, uh, and trying to rank them sort of as a breakdown of how challenging overall I find them personally. Starting with none other than the Guardian themself. It's the first sort of kind of, I, I think I would call it the tutorial boss of Slay the Spire. Guardian is the boss you'll face on your first run of a fresh save file. Seen at the end of Act 1, the Guardian is all about testing your block consistency and your endurance in a fight. So we've got a full breakdown of the stats of the bosses here at the top. You can see Ascension changes in red, blue, or purple, depending on the Ascension level that changes. So Guardian normally has 240 health, 250 on Ascension 9. And they don't get a whole lot of damage bonuses from Ascension. This is part of the reason that the, the Guardian gets a bit of a reputation as an easy boss in Slay the Spire. Note that those damage numbers barely change from Ascension 1 to Ascension 4, and then stay that way all the way up to Ascension 20. Particularly that 5 times 4 Whirlwind attack, unchanged by Ascension 4. The 8 by 2 attack where the Guardian exits defensive mode, also unchanged by Ascension levels. So this boss does nearly the same damage it does on Ascension 1 as on Ascension 20. And I think that makes the Guardian a, a fairly consistent early challenge, a, a test of the basic understanding of deck building in Slay the Spire. And so in order to, if, if you're able to get past Guardian, you sort of have your fundamentals set for the rest of the game. And I think that's uh, that makes the Guardian a very, very well-designed, I think, boss. Uh, I like the design of this enemy so much. To, to fully break it down, of course, the, the we've seen it many times on stream before, but if you're new to Slay the Spire, you may not be familiar. The Guardian is all about having a, a sort of rotational attack pattern. Uh, it follows the, the order of charging up, which it does on turn one of the combat, blocking for nine, followed by the fierce bash attack for 32 or 36 damage. If you somehow survive that, it follows up with a debuff move and then goes into Whirlwind, but you'll almost never see that because the whole point of the Guardian fight is dishing out enough damage. Uh, you need to do... It starts at uh, 30 on base Ascension level, goes to 35 on Ascension 9, or 40 damage threshold required to transform the Guardian from offensive mode to defensive mode. Every time you transform them, the Guardian increases that threshold by 10. So you have to do more and more damage each time to cause it to curl back up. Usually this isn't too much of a problem. Winning strategies against Guardian mean being able to block decently through those defensive mode turns and then attack the Guardian while it is standing. For, uh, for full damage. Making sure that you can do about 50 damage in two turns is usually what you need to be able to do to get the Guardian to curl back up. This boss is particularly vulnerable, so let's, and we're going to talk about a little bit um, the specific strategies that each class can use against all of the bosses. So let's talk strategies for each character against, uh, against this boss. Ironclad likes cards like Shrug It Off and True Grit. True Grit can get rid of attacks to make sure you're consistently drawing blocks against the Guardian. Uh, Silent likes stuff like Poison. Poison cards that deal damage over time are very, very helpful against this boss as it tends to be a fairly long fight. Good blocks like Backflip and Dodge and Roll work well as well. 
Defect loves Frost Orbs against Guardian. The passive block every turn is super duper helpful. Damage can come from Orbs as well. Lightning Orbs are very useful because they'll deal damage to the Guardian during the defensive mode turns without having to suffer the return damage of those spiked thorns. And the Watcher likes being able to have cards with retain, stuff like Sands of Time, Flying Sleeves, uh, Carve Reality or Deceive Reality. That way you can draw offensive cards on those defensive mode turns and wait until it is safe to attack again before playing them all. It's also possible to win the Guardian fight by sheer brute force. If you can just do 250 damage quickly enough without blocking at all, then you can win the fight that way. But it's absolutely one of the harder ways to win the fight. I find it cool that you can usually beat a boss either by cleverly, cleverly countering its gimmick or by inefficiently overwhelming it with power. Both ways are pretty valid. Overall, I'm going to give Guardian uh, a nice plop into our easiest tier here. The nice and easy ranking. Why? Because the Guardian is a fairly manageable boss. The questions that the Guardian asks of you aren't too difficult to answer with the cards that you're presented in Act 1. And just about every character's starting deck matches up quite nicely against the Guardian. So there's not a whole lot of card additions required to be prepared for Guardian. The real big thing to watch out for with Guardian is that turn two, the Fierce Bash. Again, hitting for 32 or 36 damage, depending on your Ascension level. Good way to make sure that you can handle the Guardian is to ensure that your health is above the threshold of that Fierce Bash attack. Uh, so if you're below, say, 32 health, resting before the Guardian might be a good idea. Our next Act 1 box, the Hexaghost. Hexaghost is a very, very different boss from the Guardian in a lot of ways. I would call Hexaghost a damage race. Hexaghost has 250 or 264 health. I like those uh, that base 6 number there. And has one of the most complicated uh, patterns. In general, the bosses of Slay the Spire have very complicated AI patterns compared to most of the enemies. Hexaghost is certainly a big example of that. Hexaghost starts with a divider attack on uh, turn two that deals damage based on the current health that you have. Uh, the exact formula is your health divided by 12, rounded down, and then plus one. So. If you have between 0 and 11 health, it does 1 times 6. Between 12 and 23 health, 2 by 6. Between 24 and 35 health, it's a 3 by 6. So on and so forth. The more health you have, the more damage it does. All the way up to, you know, 12 times 6 if you've got over 100 health. And then after that, Hexagos follows a specific attack pattern. Seer, Tackle, let's list it up here. Seer, Tackle, Seer, Inflame, Tackle, Seer, Inferno. Uh, all told, it's on turn 9 that Hexaghost uses Inferno. Prior to that, it's going to be minor attacks for 6 damage or 6 times 2. Or not a, a lot of damage total. Um, something like 30-ish total attack damage between the Divider and the Inferno. And what that means is that Hexaghost really doesn't require you to generate an, a lot of block. Just a token amount of health somewhere in the... 10 to 30 range is usually what I feel comfortable with going into the Hexaghost fight. Because of this divider move, Hexaghost almost actively punishes any attempt to rest before the fight, uh, and it's usually better to upgrade a card to deal damage to the boss. The attacks that the ghost uses, the Seer move, specifically add burns to your discard pile, and on Ascension 19 that doubles to two burns which is when Hexaghost really starts to get scary, is on Ascension 19 and above. The longer this fight goes on, the more burns accumulate. And Hexaghost has this nice little distinction of being able to upgrade all of the burns when Inferno activates. That Inferno move causes each burn to do 4 damage to you, assuming you survive the 6x6 damage it deals up front. Ultimately, all of this means that the longer the fight goes on, the better Hexaghost performs in the fight. 
So the easiest and simplest way to beat Hexaghost is simply to deal that 264 damage in 9 turns. There's a number of ways to do this. Ironclad that loves to bop Hexaghost down with a little bit of strength. Um, you can even, so, and in Flames are very good. Spot Weakness works really well against Hexaghost also, since Hexaghost frequently attacks, so highly recommend strength sources for Ironclad. Making sure you can apply Vulnerable to Ghost to keep your attacks hitting hard is also important. For Silence, Poison and Thorns are the way to victory here. Poison's damage per turn, particularly Bouncing Flask, is excellent at being able to deal enough damage. Caltrops work pretty well also, being able to hit the Hexaghost back for each of those six attacks that it sends your way. On Defect, Lightning Orbs are essential, that damage per turn is huge, and you want to multiply that if possible, either by getting Focus or by uh, getting a lock-on card that can amplify the damage. Any sort of scaling or persistently powerful attack will work pretty well too. Streamline, since you're going to be able to play it a few times. Claw to do escalating damage. These are all pretty nice ways for Defect to get the required damage. Watcher doesn't usually have as much trouble against Hexaghost. The big thing to watch out for is uh, avoiding being hit by Tackled or Divider when in Wrath Stance, as these attacks do enough damage when doubled to be a serious threat to the Watcher. So Watcher is usually about making sure you're able to get into Wrath on the right turn. For this, I really recommend something like a, a Crescendo or Simmering Fury, or just a second Wrath card in general. Um, cards like Empty Fist or Empty Mind or Empty Body that can give you access to a way out of Wrath. Um, and of course, adding additional damage with something like Crush Joints is also highly recommended. It's possible to survive the Hexaghost by blocking, but of basically all of the fights in the game, this is the one where defensive strategies are least effective trying to lower Hexaghost's strength, trying to accumulate block, all of these things tend to be crushed under the weight of a thousand burns. When you're unable to draw any more cards, you really can't do much. You can try exhausting the burns um, with something like True Grit or Second Wind on Ironclad, Recycle on Defects, but it's very difficult to keep up with the rate at which Hexaghost adds them, and Hexaghost's gradually increasing strength will still prove a problem in this case. Only if you can destroy the status cards and counter the strength gain of the boss uh, is really is it really effective to to block against Hexaghost. I've seen that maybe one time. It was Inserter plus Consume on Defect with a medical kit. Uh, I don't think that ever really naturally happens much. So blocking against Hexaghost, almost always a losing strategy. That said, because Hexaghost doesn't require you to have a lot of health to win, you usually are able to upgrade a card before this boss. And if you've been aggressively picking damage in Act 1, I find Hexaghost is challenging but manageable, usually. A lot more challenging for Silent in particular, who really does have the, the lowest starting damage of all the characters and less options for dealing with the Ghost. But as long as you see one or two decent poison cards, you'll really have no problem if you pick them and play them. So we'll put, we'll put Hexaghost in the yellow tier for this reason. Don't... Don't often die to Hexaghost, but absolutely does get me occasionally. All the bosses in Slay the Spire do. So even, even the ones that are quote-unquote easy are able to get victories now and then. Our third boss, the Slime Boss. Slime Boss is a very straightforward fight, at least initially. But you find yourself outnumbered rather swiftly. Slime Boss has the lowest initial health of all bosses and takes his time actually doing anything. On turn one, the slime boss adds a whole bunch of slime to your discard pile. You won't draw these for a while, so it is really not immediately threatening at all. And then on turn two, the slime boss skips his turn. So slime boss requires that you do nothing on turn one or on turn two. However, on turn three, you're going to get crushed. And the only way to avoid getting crushed is to split the slime boss in two by dealing half of their maximum health. And this, I would say, creates a split in strategies for the slime boss. You have one of two options. Either you deal 75 damage in three turns in order to prevent yourself from getting crushed, or you somehow block for 38. 
or some fraction thereof. Uh, Weaken really helps in this regard. Applying Weak to Slime Boss brings 38 all the way down to 28, a 10, health, 10 damage reduction, which is a lot more manageable to block. If you do block the Slime Crush, you're going to get more Slimed added to your deck the turn after, so you really have to be able to capitalize on those extra turns. One of my favorite ways to do this, the Relic Stone Calendar, dealing a whole bunch of damage on turn 7. If you block the first Slime Crush, then you can wait until the Stone Calendar is ready to go off before uh, splitting the Slime Boss in two, basically. Slime Boss is ultimately a question of how much damage you can deal. Every time the Slime Boss reaches half health, um, it splits into a smaller slime, and the, those two sl one big gray acid slime and one big green, or sorry, gray, gray spike slime, green acid slime. And those will also split into two medium slimes when they themselves reach half health. When they split, they create two copies, each with the same health as the original creature. So when the split occurs, essentially the health that is remaining gets doubled. Therefore, the more damage you do prior to the split, the less health is getting doubled and the more effective damage you've done. That makes the easiest way by far to deal with Slime Boss. Just deal 150 damage up front and kill it instantly. Now, Ironclad can do that with enough strength gain. Very, very difficult for Silent to do. Silent struggles with Slime Boss extremely greatly because she has comparatively few tools in her kit to prepare for Slime Boss. Uh, Silent versus Slime Boss, a very, very challenging matchup. It just is such that the combination of the slimes added to your discard pile, the relatively low damage of the Silent, and the debuffs that the two resulting slimes can inflict upon you uh, really weigh her down more than most. Dealing with Slime Boss requires getting some... Well, it doesn't require, but uh, may be a lot easier if you've got a good sort of area damage. If you have cards that can apply damage to multiple creatures. For Silent, I'm usually keeping my eyes out for cards like Dagger Spray, All at Attack, Die Die Die, Noxious Fumes in particular as it applies poison to everybody every turn. Things that apply debuffs to the Slime Boss are usually pretty ineffective, so Poison and Vulnerable are out here, because if the Slime Boss splits in two, the debuffs are removed. Defect here loves Dark Orbs in particular, since you get lots of free turns, you can charge those orbs up to a very big number and then evoke for massive damage. Lightning Orbs are okay, especially if, if you've got Electrodynamics. Um, and the card Sunder does a really good job of blopping the small slimes once you've split them in two a couple of times. Watcher has very, very little difficulty with Slime Boss because you're able to interrupt the slimes' attacks by bringing them below half HP, and if you use Wrath Stance to double your attack damage, you can ignore the downside of Wrath Stance by simply splitting the slimes in two repeatedly. It's fairly easy for Watcher to uh, just crush the slime boss into a pile of goo with upfront offense, no problem. All things considered, for most classes, I'd say slime boss falls into consistently very challenging. Powers are particularly effective in this fight, no matter the character. Powers are not going to be affected as much by the debuffs. Um, combust on Ironclad can be a really nice way to get past the slime boss. I also recommend Evolve or Feel No Pain. Both of those will help you with the added status cards. Any orb power on defects is going to be really helpful too. Orbs provide per passive per turn bonuses. And the slime boss... It, those slimes clogging your hand aren't a problem if most of your per turn benefit comes from your orbs. Fire breathing also a very good one on Ironclad. I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are some cards that, that solve this fight really nicely, but are kind of undesirable for other parts of the game. I think fire breathing is a good example of that. Thousand Cuts on Silent, very good against this enemy, not very good in many other situations, that's okay. Uh, Sweeping Beam on Defect is a pretty good card for this fight, but not that great for many other situations. Uh, car, uh, not Car Reality. Battle Him, the one that generates a smite every turn on Watcher, very good in this fight. I think Battle Him is nice on Watcher in general, but uh, it tends to be a bit slow, but very, very good against the Slime Boss. 
So that's the Act 1 bosses. I think that feels like a, a correct ranking to me. Slime boss, most difficult, hexaghost medium, guardian the easiest. I, I would say that tends to, to fall along the lines of fairly average for me. And that's more of a representation of like, what is the chance? What is the percent chance that I'm going to have a difficult time with this boss? Any given run might have a, a very easy time with slime boss or a very difficult time with guardian as the random circumstances line, but these are the the consistent averages, I, I tend to think. So let's talk about Act 2 then. There's lots more bosses to speak about. I'm going to try to pick up the pace a little bit here. First up, Bronze Tamaton and their orbs. Bronze Tamaton and, well, the Act 2 bosses in general are a big step up from the Act 1. They don't have dramatically higher health pools. For example, Bronze Tamaton here sporting 300 health. That's only a little bit more than the 250 of Hexaghost. But the Act 2 bosses all have some sort of debilitating gimmick. They inflict a penalty upon the player of some sorts that limits your own ability to do things. And they have much greater offensive presence themselves. They do way more damage than Act 1 bosses do. So, Bronze Automaton. Bronze Automaton's got this fun little rotational pattern. Summons orb minions on turn 1. Those orb minions will then harass you and try to steal your cards, specifically your rarest cards, which can definitely mess with some strategies. Very important going into Bronze Automaton that your deck not be dependent upon a single particular rare card. For example, if you're on Ironclad and your only way to do lots of damage is to play one demon form that you have, then if that demon form gets stolen by the orbs, you can be in really big trouble. So having a few redundant ways to escalate your damage over time can really help with this fight. After that initial summon, the Bronze Automaton has a, an alternating attack and buff pattern. They do a times two attack, then they buff, they do a times two attack, then they buff, and then on turn six, they hyper beam. One giant attack with a base attack power of 50, and that is added to their strength. So on a 20, you'll see the hyper beam attack for 58, 50 damage plus eight strength. On a 15, it's 56. I think on base ascension, it's only 51, the hyper beam. Either way, it's an enormous amount of damage. And uh, usually, again, the kind of like with Slime Boss, you have a, a two main options here. You either survive that giant hyper beam somehow, which means blocking for a very large amount on one particular turn. You can do this with retained block cards, uh, Runic Pyramid and uh, an Impervious or just drawn impervious on the right turn. Um, Well-laid plans with a leg sweep works pretty well. Applying weaken is a, a huge boon here because it'll cut 15 points of damage off the hyper beam from 58 down to 43. Having intangible can really help too. The relic incense burner is especially useful. Set it to zero on the first turn of the Bronze Automaton fight, and it'll automatically block Hyper Beam for you, bringing it down to one damage. That's a really easy solve for the Automaton fight. It can be a little difficult to choose whether you're going to go for the Orbs first or the Automaton. Another thing to note in this fight is the Artifact Charges. Uh, it takes three debuffs before the Bronze Automaton can be affected by any debuffs owing to its starting at three artifacts. And that means you can't be dependent on just one or two debuffs either. You have to have ways to apply multiple debuffs or you have to wait half of a card that can remove those artifact layers. Something like a Bouncing Flask, an Uppercut, a Shockwave. All these things make the Bronze Automaton pretty challenging. I think I would probably rank Bronze Automaton in the orange tier here. Consistently difficult, owing to the short time frame you have to end the fight. It's quite difficult to do the required 300 damage in six turns. If you've got a really good damage plan, it's very doable. Uh, but if you can't, then you must have a good block game. Even that alone is not sufficient, because the longer the fight goes on, the, quick, the quicker Bronze Automaton's strength seems to go 
upwards and you'll quickly find yourself having to deal with 50 plus damage every other turn. So it really is a, a timer, as many of these boss fights are. A question of your ability to do enough damage in a short enough time frame. I think that as we get a little further into the run, once you're past Act 1, it, it's a lot less class dependent on um, on how the, the bosses are difficult for you. So I don't think that there's as much a difference in class for the Act 2 bosses as there is for the Act 1 bosses, for example. Another thing I didn't mention about for countering the Hyper Beam from Bronze Automaton, Buffer from the Defect card Buffer or from the Relic Fossilized Helix is a good way to completely ignore the Hyper Beam. All right, who's next? The Collector. Collector, I think, is one of my one of my most lost two bosses. One of the bosses that defeats me most often. Collector is a huge check of your ability to deal with multiple threats. Collector themselves has another a, a very high health pool, about 300, similar to the Bronze Automaton, although no artifact layers. Collector, like Bronze Automaton, summons minions, minions on turn one. Those minions just attack every turn and have about 40 health. They're not too bad to deal with, but they get really strong really quickly as the Collector buffs strength. Collector is further made problematic by a semi-random attack pattern. So how exactly Collector works is that on turn one, they always summon two minions. Then on turn two and turn three, they have a chance to buff or attack. And there's also a chance to resummon a minion if you've managed to kill one already. That can't occur on turn two, but a resummon can occur on turn three. Resummon check occurs as long as one minion is dead. The collector does summon back up to two minions. So if you see the summon intent, which is the three question marks appearing over collector's head, um, then you shouldn't kill the remaining minion on the board. Because if they're still alive when the collector resummons, then only one new torch head is created and the other torch head stays at, at its current health. So it can be helpful to delay a kill there for a bit. The real problem comes on turn four when the collector does their mega debuff. Weak, vulnerable, and frail means that your block is you're taking way more damage, your blocks are less effective, and your damage is less effective. You're just worse at everything. Uh, and that's three difficult turns normally, but very crucially on Ascension, 19 becomes five turns of debuff. And that is a very difficult thing to deal with. Ultimately, things that are effective against the Collector are... Sources of area damage that can help you harm Collector while also killing the minions. On Ironclad, this is stuff like Immolate, Whirlwind, Thunderclap, Cleave, Combust. On Silent, it's things like Noxious Fumes, Crippling Cloud, Dagger Sprays. Corpse Explosion works particularly well, as you can use Corpse Explosion on one of the minions to kill the other minion and hurt the Collector. On defect, electrodynamics is very effective, as are orbs in general. Watcher likes to have a little bit of area damage here. Consecrates can be good. Conclude is a little difficult because of the debuffs. Specimen can help on the uh, on the silent too. That's true. The other things that are exceedingly useful in the Collector fight are anything that get to ignore the debuffs. Any non-attack damage, so damage coming directly from powers like Combust, or a Thousand Cuts, or Noxious Fumes, or Orbs. These are all things that ignore weakness, so you don't take reduced damage. Alpha, Beta, Omega on Watcher are actually pretty good at this fight too. The colorless card, the bomb, also has particular note in the collector fight, as it does just enough damage to kill the torch heads very cleanly. Uh, if you're playing below Ascension 9, then an unupgraded bomb will always kill torch heads. Or if you're playing above Ascension 9, then you have to have an upgraded bomb to cleanly kill them. Mitigation strategies that do not suffer from frail are also effective here. Strength down on the collector is really helpful. Weakening the Collector is really helpful, because it reduces that damage by 25%, even through the debuffs. And... 
block directly from powers like Feel No Pain, Metallicize, Mental Fortress. All these things are really good ways to deal with the Collector. Another strategy, uh, one that I very rarely get to employ, I think because it's fairly difficult to assemble, but one that works really well is to remove or ignore the debuffs of the Collector. The Collector applies debuffs in the order Weak, Vulnerable, Frail. So if you have two artifact charges, not one, but two, two artifact charges, such as from a Panacea Plus, will block the Frail, the, uh, sorry, the Vulnerable, and mean you won't take any additional damage for the five turns, which is super duper useful. More easily, you can use Orange Pellets to clear the debuffs by playing a power attack in the skill. Although that can be a little bit difficult to do on turn five, which is when you would need to do it. Overall, I find Collector really, really consistently challenging. Wouldn't call Collector unfair in any way, but definitely dang hard. One of the hardest bosses in the game, for sure. Definitely my my choice for the top dog of Act 2. Let's talk Champ. Champ's got a big, big list for his AI pattern. Look at that. Look at all that text. Champ has the most complicated... AI of any enemy in Slay the Spire. It's semi-fixed, semi-random, and has two distinct phases, one above half health, one below half health. Changes dramatically between Ascension levels too, so he's got a lot of different things that he can do. How he works, he spends the first half of the fight, when champ is above half health, he'll mess around with you. He'll alternate between hitting you with a couple of relatively weak attacks, face slap and heavy slash, deal 14 and 18 damage respectively. He can also enter defensive stance to give himself metallicize or buff his strength to become stronger, making those um, making those basic attacks hit way, 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 way harder. Every four turns, he'll use Taunt, making you weak and, vulner weak and vulnerable. Note it's not random. So, so how Champ's phase one pattern is random move, random move, random move, Taunt on turn four. Then random move, random move, random move, Taunt again. So three random things, followed by a fixed thing, followed by three random moves, followed by a fixed thing again. In addition, Champ can't do the same thing twice in a row. He can only metallicize twice, and if you're on Ascension 19, he has to metallicize before he buffs strength. I don't know why, but that's how it works. That's not true below Ascension 19 for some reason. Did you know that you can now support me directly on YouTube by getting a channel membership? For as low as five bucks a month, you'll get access to perks like custom badges and emojis to use in comments, and discounts on the merch store, all while helping support me and this channel. Just click the join button below to get started. Now back to the video. Essentially, this is a, a first half of the fight where Champ is kind of messing around, slowly building power, uh, but not really attacking you much. And this is your opportunity to set up for phase two, because when Champ drops below half health, he gets angry. The first turn went upon dropping below half health. Champ will purge all debuffs from himself, all poison, vulnerable, weaken, strength down, you name it, and then give himself a ton of strength, 12 strength on A20, followed by his dreaded execute move. You're likely to be vulnerable when this happens and followed up combined with his immense strength gain. You're usually looking at a number somewhere along, along the lines of 33 by two. Another common one is 24 by 2. So 50, 50 plus damage usually from execute. You're usually vulnerable. You're usually also frail. This means blocking execute is very, very difficult. However, because the execute comes at a time of your manipulation, it's, it's entirely dependent upon champ's health. That means that you have control over when the, the execute occurs. To successfully beat champ means that you have to put, you have to set up the combat in such a way by playing powers or choosing which cards to play when, such that you can 
either kill champ outright from half health before he lands his execute on you, or you have some block plan in play. Intangible is a really good one. Sometimes lizard tail or burying a bottle is a, a successful strategy, but things like dark shackles, piercing whale, malaise, um, impervious, lots of frost orbs, or barricaded block from earlier can all do pretty well against champ. For silence, uh, sorry, for ironclad, usually I find getting a, a lot of strength. About 10 strength is sufficient to kill champ before he hits you with execute. Silent can have a really hard time here uh, because of the debuff purging. Usually poison is one of your best ways to damage champ, but he'll remove it when dropping below half health, which can make things difficult. If you can apply a ton of poison all at once with Catalyst, that's an easy win, though. Again, Defects. Defect likes to set up uh, with all the time in the world. Creative AI is a really, really easy way to beat champ as Defect because you can play the Creative AI and then just play all of the powers that you want before dropping champ below half health. Watcher's usually able to set up some kind of kill with retaining cards. They work really well against champ. Um, set up a Wrath or better yet Divinity turn where you're able to dish out a couple hundred damage in one turn and you can drop champ that way. Overall, champ is a an interesting mix. He's a challenging boss, but definitely. Um, but certainly, uh, I would almost give him the definition of manageable gimmick, for sure. This guy is all about his gimmick. Either you see it coming, and you make proper preparations, and you beat him that way, or he smashes your face in. Those are kind of the two ways it's going to go. But you have a lot of ways to answer his gimmick. There's a thousand and one ways to kill Champ. I think he's the most bullyable boss in the game, which is to say that you can... He's the boss against whom it is most easy to get the combat into a situation where he has no chance against you because you have outscaled him, because you have put so many powers in play that he can no longer do anything, or because you have lined up a kill before he can possibly answer you. Dark Orbs on Defect are one of my favorite ways, but I, I think my most favorite way to beat Champ is by dual-wielding Metallicize as Ironclad and gaining 100 block per turn. That's fun. That's fun. He gives you a free hit. How nice, right? From champ to chump. All right, those are the Act 2 bosses. I think they tend to be pretty difficult on average. Two in our uh, our orange tier, and then champ. Champ's the easy one of the bunch. And I really even wouldn't say he's that easy. Let's talk about the bosses of Act 3. First up, Tim the Time Eater. Time Eater's a, an interesting one. Time Eater, I, I would say, is one of the bosses that gets more most additionally challenging with High Ascension, and I would also say that Time Eater is a boss against whom the actual turn-to-turn -turn decisions you make are very, very important. Time Eater's main gimmick is, of course, the clock. Every 12 cards you play, there's a constantly advancing timer below Time Eater's uh, health bar. Every 12 cards you play, Time Eater forcibly ends your turn, which feels super unfair, and then gains two strength. This means that you have to make sure that every card you play against Time Eater is worth it. What does worth it mean? I tend to think that, kind of as a rough ballpark, you need to make sure each of your cards is doing at least 10. 10 number, 10 block, 10 damage, doesn't matter. You have to get at least 10 number out of the card, or you're giving too much power to the time eater for that card to be worth it. So for example, individual shivs are usually really not worth playing against the time eater because you're just going to make him angry without actually getting much done. It also means that you can't usually kill the tri time eater with a simple loop infinite of something like cycling two drop kicks or a, a finesse and a flash of steel because the even though you're able to in under normal circumstances play those cards say an infinite number of times the limit that the time eater puts upon you means those cards are not doing enough now that's not to say that infinite combo decks can't beat the the 
Time Eater. Actually, one of the easiest ways to beat Time Eater is to play consistently 12 cards every single turn, as long as each of those 12 cards is high impact enough to beat him. But that's not all Time Eater has up their sleeve. Part of the problem with this fight is that Time Eater is one of those semi-random bosses which really adds to the challenge. There's only three things that the Time Eater can do on any given turn. They've got two attacks, the times three multi-attack, normally an eight by three, the head slam, a single attack for 32. This is the nasty one. Head slam also gives you draw reduction one for two turns, causing you to draw less cards. One less card for two turns is minus two draws. And if you're on Ascension 19, this move also adds two slimed to the discard pile. That means on Ascension 19, every head slam is effectively minus four draws for the player. Two draws you lose over the next two turns, and two more draws you lose when you draw the slimes. This means that relying on your base five card per turn draw against Time Eater is, I would almost say, outright unviable. You must have additional draw or retain, better yet, to deal with Time Eater effectively. Pyramid's really, really good here. Uh, but Welly Plans is actually even better, because you can discard cards without playing them. So Silent has a particular advantage here, I think, if you found a Welly Plans. Once Time Eater drops below half health, they're going to turn back time on you, with the first turn after dropping below half being a heal back to half HP and a reversal of all debuffs. This is where carefully playing your cards can become really important. Any damage you deal on the turn before Time Eater heals back up to half health is effectively wasted. Where, meanwhile, all of those cards are still being counted against you with the Time Eater's timer and working towards the Time Eater's strength gain. So you really don't want to be playing cards when Time Eater has that heal, heal intent displayed. That's the blue flame intent for the Time Eater. The third random thing that they can do during the early turns is a debuff move. They'll block and apply vulnerable and weak to you on a 20 plus, uh, on Ascension 19 plus, excuse me, that also adds frail. That debuff is always followed up by an attacking move. Since Time Eater is all about penalizing you per card played, making all of your cards less efficient and then attacking you for a big number all at once is, is kind of a, a way of force testing whether your deck is capable of being efficient on a particular turn. Usually not, and I tend to find that uh, Time Eater really, really gives you a, a tough time uh, as a result. I think I find Time Eater probably in the range of manageable gimmick on the lower ascensions before the slime start to accumulate, but the Ascension 19 change, I'd say Time Eater is probably one of the bosses most affected by Ascension 19. The Ascension 19 changes, adding Frail to that debuff turn and adding the two slimed, really escalate Time Eater into serious threat territory. And I would definitely rank Time Eater as consistently a challenge. Uh, also a real tough time for Runic Dome. Some tips of advice for Time Eater in general. I, I often hear about folks struggling with the Time Eater. And something to note is that you, unless you're playing on a 20, you'll always have warning that the Time Eater is coming. You can look ahead and see that your the Time Eater is coming up at the end of the third act. And that is your chance to prepare accordingly. Pick cards that have a large impact for the number of cards you have to play. Even if you are currently, for example, let's say you're a silent with after two after images and a bunch of shiv cards. Doesn't mean you shouldn't take a bouncing flask if you see one in act three going into Time Eater. Does it fit with the rest of the cards in your deck? No. Does it do effective things against a boss that you're weak against? Yes. And picking counter cards to specifically answer threats that you don't have a counter to is a core thing to be doing in Slay the Spire. Another thing you can do, uh, I found myself doing this really early on in my Slay the Spire play, but I really haven't done it much since. I, I think because of the double bosses of A20 more than anything. Fighting Slime Eater, Slime Eater, Time Eater in Act 3, something that could help you is removing cards that are kind of uh, spammy or zero cost or below that 10 number value. So for example, if, you, if you've got a Blade Dance and you don't have any accuracies, you don't have a kunai or a shuriken, consider removing it outright before you fight Time Eater. Consider removing 
the escape plan or the finesse. Consider removing the drop kick. Consider removing the double tap or the burst. These are all things that can really slow you down against time meters specifically. Lastly but not least, never underestimate the value of skip... Actually, that, uh, speaking of that, that 10 threshold, never underestimate the value of skipping your turn against time meter. If you don't play any cards, the time meter can't gain any strength. So making sure that you don't play strikes for four damage or defends for three damage, uh, three block when weak or frail, can be a, a really important way to make sure that the time meter's strength stays manageable. Don't play cards that are low impact. Just focus on playing the few most impactful cards that your deck can draw each turn and try to use that to come out ahead of the curve, so to speak. Yeah, just because you have energy doesn't mean you need to spend it all. In this fight, then that is certainly true. Exhausting some of the less useful cards in the fight can also be quite helpful. I'd say overall, one of the easiest answers to Time Eater is powers. Lots of powers of any kind, since they're all generally put them into play and then receive ongoing benefits sort of deals, they're exactly the sort of card that work best against Time Eater. The problem with that is that in the very same act, we've also got our next boss here. Oh, I'm talking about the Awakened One. The Awakened One. The Awakened One is a boss that's all about scaling off of your powers. And the boy do they ever. The curiosity effect. The Awakened One gains one strength every time you play a power. Two strengths if you're on Ascension 19 and up. And I think that's where Awakened One really gets pretty nasty. The Awakened One is, shockingly enough, one of the most simple bosses. One of the most simple enemies in Slay the Spire. Early on, they actually only have two things they do. They either attack you for a multi-hit of 6x4, or they attack you for a single hit of 20. And they'll just do these two things back and forth every turn until you kill the first phase of the Awakened One. The Awakened One also doesn't gain strength under any circumstances other than you playing powers, so the strength gain of this boss is entirely in the player's hands. And that gives you a lot of counterplay. For me, oh, powers against Awaken One is, is all a question of which ones are worth it. Not every power is worth playing against the Awaken One. Some shouldn't be played. Some should be. Since a power gives the Awaken One two strength, I like to look at that as two damage on two out of three turns. And on, on the third turn, it's eight additional damage on that times four. The pattern is usually slash slash soul strike. Um, but the exact timing of Soul Strike is semi-random. It's a 25% chance that they use Soul Strike after one slash, a 75% chance that they use Soul Strike after two slashes. Complicating factor are the two cultists that start with the Awakened One. They're the that base enemy from Floor 1, starting at 6 damage and then going up by 5 per turn. They're easy if you've got any sort of area damage and can kill it, quickly kill them. But if you're focused on dealing with the boss, you might find that the cultists very quickly become a huge problem and do very enormous damage if you cannot remove them from the field quickly. So this boss is kind of a twofold test. One, can you get rid of those minions quickly? I think it's usually not too not too difficult because if you've been through Act 2, you've already had to pass the same check. You had to deal with minions that have basically the same health with Collector, or you had to deal with the Orbs of the Bronze Automaton. Their health pool really isn't that high, so I don't usually find them too difficult, but you can get into a problem if your ability to kill the Cultists is dependent on playing a power. So, for example, if you can only kill them with Electrodynamics, or with Combust, or with Noxious Fumes, then you might find that you're in Trouble Town. Now, one of the best ways to deal with the Awakened One is to lower the Awakened One's strength. Ironclad can do this with Disarm, Silent can do it with Malaise, and you can also do it by temporarily lowering the Awakened One's strength on the turn that you kill the first phase. When the Awakened One dies, it checks its current strength value 
and that persists to the second phase, but all other effects on the boss are removed, all debuffs and buffs both. So if you play a Piercing Whale, and then on the same turn kill the Awakened One, the game only sees the Awakened One's current strength value, not the temporarily debuffed. It doesn't remember that there's a temporary debuff there, essentially, and so the strength reduction can become permanent, although this can't bring the Awakened One down into negative strength. I wouldn't call this a bug, necessarily, more of a inevitable consequence of the mechanics interactions. Never heard a reasonable proposal for how to fix it that wouldn't cause the inverse problem in many situations, like wouldn't result in a equal but opposite unintended effect under similar circumstances or without coding in unique special exceptions to particular fights, which is kludgy as hell. Would definitely call the Awakened One the longest battle in the game. There's a couple of reasons for this. One, the Awakened One has the highest health pool of all the Act One bosses. 320 base, but it revives when killed, so make it 640, plus two cultist minions, about 100 more health, plus 15 health regenerated per turn. All this combines to say that uh, 20 turn Awakened One fights are not unusual. Because the fight is so long, I tend to feel like the Awakened One is often a check of your ability to block consistently. The Awakened One attacks on every single one of those turns, often for only a relatively small amount of damage. Um, but you must, must be able to keep the block up consistently, or you'll take chip damage here and there. To that extent, I do kind of feel like Awakened One is, is sort of Guardian Butt, but more so in a lot of ways. A lot of uh, the strategies are very similar in terms of success. You want to do damage here and there while mostly focusing on making sure that your block output is good. Below Ascension 19, I would probably rank Awaken 1 as one of the easiest bosses in the game. Many of your powers are simply, if you're the Awaken 1's only gaining one strength per power, it's easy enough to play. Um, the good powers, anything that gives you decent block, like footwork or defragment, comes out ahead. Whereas more damaging powers can be skipped. On A19 and up, I, I think I have to give Awaken 1 manageable gimmick territory. This boss really doesn't do that much damage if you don't play any powers. Uh, and it's very possible to, to stay on top of their damage curve pretty effectively. Uh, especially so if you can gain scaling in some way that doesn't involve playing a power. So the relics Shuriken and Kunai, capable of giving you strength or dexterity without having to play powers. The defect card Consume gives you focus without having to play a power. These are ways to absolutely dunk on this boss because you effectively get to cheat the mechanics of the fight. So that's how I feel about uh, Awaken 1. It definitely one of the easier bosses of the game. I think the easiest boss of Act 3 for sure. So the last Act 3 boss then, Donu and Dekka. The Shape Twins. These two are a, a fun one. Definitely used to consider these the hardest final boss of the game back when Act 3 was the finale. This is the only double boss battle in Slay the Spire. Two shapes, each rocking about 250 health. Donu and Dekka are an unrelenting assault that is constantly escalating. Unlike the other bosses of Act 3, whose strength gain is entirely dependent on the player's actions, Donu and Dekka are a strict turn-by-turn -turn countdown with constant escalation happening that is going to wear down the player if they're unable to put a swift end to the fight. So each of them have their own little things. Dekka is the defensive one. Dekka's focus is on slowing down the player so that Donu can ramp up damage. Dekka does this by providing block to itself and its shapely compatriots every other turn. This block also provides plated armor on Ascension 19 and up which can accumulate in some nasty ways. I have seen a grand total of one time on somebody else's stream, them getting soft locked 
against Dekka because Dekka applied so much plated armor that they were unable to damage Dekka. Meanwhile, they'd killed Donu, so Dekka was unable to damage them. They were unable to break through the increasingly escalating block of Dekka, and a stalemate resulted. That's pretty rare, though. Mostly what happens is that Donu, every two turns, buffs the strength of both of them, plus three strength to both, which means six additional damage headed your way per attack every two turns. Starts out as a 12 by 2, 15 by 2 is not too bad, then 18 by 2, that starts to get scary. 22 by, uh, 21 by 2, 24 by 2, 27 by 2. And by the time you reach 30 by 2, uh, hopefully you've won the fight because it's it's starting to get really, really challenging to survive at that point. You've also got Dazed being added by Dekka's attacks, which are going to slow down your draws and make it more difficult for you to have a hand of blocks to deal with that increasing damage. My usual advice in this fight is to focus on Donu first. Donu's the one doing the strength buffing, so if you kill Donu, then all Dekka can do is block and attack for the same number every two turns. That's usually a manageable one-on-one. -on -one. It can, however, be correct to, block, uh, to kill Dekka first if your deck is particularly vulnerable to having your draw messed with by dazes. If you're trying to do like a dropkick loop or something with a sundial, if you've got a minimalist deck with only a few cards in it, these are all situations where killing Dekka first could be good. Killing Dekka first is also a really good idea if your deck just blocks for 100 because you don't care that Donu gets extra strength because you're blocking so well. Certain Sometimes Defect might want to do this. I tend to find that this fight is pretty manageable if you are on top of the power curve in Slay the Spire, but if you're running a slower, more defense-heavy deck, then Donu and Dekka are going to run all over you. They're pretty challenging overall. I almost want to put them between the uh, the orange and the yellow tier here. Maybe we should put one of them in one and the other in the other. I could put, I could put Dekka here and Donu here. That doesn't feel right. That feels... <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't feel right at all. I think they belong together in the in the yellow category. One step below Time Eater, I think. They're definitely above Awakened One in terms of difficulty, though. So it's a little difficult to judge. And you're right, that's Dekka and Donu, not D Donu and Dekka. There they are. There they are. They don't want to split the family. That's That's cruel. That's cruel. Okay. Need more categories, clearly. Last but certainly not least, hiding in Act 4. That stinky, stinky corrupt heart. Corrupt heart by far, in, and intentionally so, of course, the most challenging boss in Slay the Spire. It's got more health than any of them, rocking 750 or 800 at Ascension 9, and has just an absolutely devastating set of attacks. On turn one, the heart has <laughs> the debilitate move. Just seems <laughs> so ridiculous. So, but debilitate, you are hit with all status effects, weak and vulnerable and frail, and then you have one of every status card added into your draw pile. So one slime, burn, wound, dazed, and void, all into your draw pile. And then to make things, to add injury to insult, the heart then attacks you for some very scary numbers the turns immediately following that debuff the echo big 45 damage attack is 67 if you're vulnerable or the multi-attack hits for 3 by 15 basically those first two attacks from the hearts are going to outright kill any character from full health unmodified so you need to generate a very large amount of block in order to be able to survive this. Since you're frail, your block goes less of a distance too. So in order to be able to block that 67 damage big hit, you need to be able to generate 100 block through frail in one turn to not get absolutely rolled on by the heart. And that's just turn two. Things get only worse the longer the fight goes on. 
Ways to survive this heart fight involve having a multi-layered defense strategy of some kind. It's, as you might imagine, very difficult to just come up with a hundred blocks suddenly. Although it's certainly something that a run is capable of doing. There's lots of ways to do it with all the characters. You've had an entire run to prepare. So Ironclad could have multiple copies of Feel No Pain or Barricade and Trench. Silent could have lots of footworks and dexterity or a wraith form. Piercing Whales work really well. Defect can have Focus and lots of Frost. Watcher can have lots of dexterity and various cards. You can have Vault for extra turns. But all of this is fairly difficult to put together consistently because of those added status cards to the draw pile. Your ability to consistently draw a defensive answer to these attacks is unlikely without some sort of draw or retain assistance. Other ways to lower the damage that you have to block, if you make the heart weak, you significantly reduce the damage very, very dramatically. If you can prevent yourself from becoming vulnerable, one artifact charge will do this. You can also use the Odd Mushroom Relic from Act 1 to reduce the damage you take when vulnerable. Added max health goes a long way here as well, giving you a bit more buffer space to try to survive the heart. Certain defensive relics can go a huge, huge way here as well. The Relic Tungsten Rod can reduce the damage you take from Beat of Death. You can also make that times 15 multi-hit do a lot less damage to your health pool. The Relic... Incense Burner can make you intangible. Setting Incense Burner to three or four entering the heart fight will prevent one of the first two attacks and save you a lot of health. Unfortunately, the order of the attacks is random. The times 15 and the 45, it's a 50-50 which one comes first. So there's no way to know for sure exactly when the attack will occur. That makes lining up the Incense Burner or making effective use of buffer from fossilized helix very difficult. Helix is exceedingly helpful in heart fights where the big hit arrives first, as you can just absorb that with the buffer and then have your health to use on the rest of the fight. But if the times 15 multi attack comes first, it's very difficult to keep the buffer intact in order to use it on the follow up. It's just one of the many things that makes the heart fight very, very, very challenging. So further complicating things, not only does the thing have giant amounts of health and does huge damage, but it buffs itself every three turns, and each of those buffs has a unique effect. It's a particularly interesting little interaction here. Check the list of additional buffs. So the first buff, each buff gives it two strength and removes any negative strength that's applied already. So cards like Malaise and Disarm only work against this boss temporarily, although they're still useful. The first time it buffs strength, you get it gets two artifact charges, negating two debuffs. That's really nasty, as it can make keeping weaken on the heart very difficult. It can make applying poison challenging temporarily, um, and it shuts down your ability to use Piercing Whale or Dark Shackles to block a multi-hit until you're able to remove the artifact layers. That can be a really, really big problem. The second buff increases Beat of Death by one. It goes from either one to two or two to three, depending on your Ascension level. That can make your per card efficiency go down dramatically, which can make it very difficult to block against the heart. The third buff adds painful stabs, meaning any hit from the heart will add a wound to your discard pile. Oddly enough, that one's almost never relevant because if you're getting hit by the heart's attacks at this point, you're probably not going to survive long enough to actually draw the wounds. But it could matter maybe at some point. I think that's the least impactful buff. The fourth buff is an additional 10 strength, and the fifth one is an additional 50 points of strength for a unit that can attack you 15 times per turn. Essentially, the, the fourth buff is an enrage timer, if you're familiar with that mechanic. If you stick around in this fight too long, the heart will decide you're dead. It doesn't matter how much block you can make. It doesn't matter how much health you have. You will be killed by an astoundingly powerful multi-hit attacks. Yeah, 72 by 15 is the number you may have seen on a stream before. Surviving that, almost out of the question, not impossible. There are ways to do it. There are ways to hang out in that fight for a very long time, but it's a very, very challenging thing to do. In practice, this means that you not only have to 
survive all of these absurdly damaging attacks, but you must also deal a huge amount of damage back to the Corrupt Heart. As if that weren't enough, the Invincible buff of the Heart caps your damage per turn, so you must deal damage over multiple turns in large quantities in order to end the fight quickly. This means that uh, any sort of strategy dependent on just doing one really big attack, like an ice cream whirlwind or um, a really big tempest on defect or evoking one single powerful dark orb or any of that will fail because you need to be able to do damage on multiple turns. Again, all while trying to survive the absolutely terrifying array of attacks. For all of these reasons, I think the heart is a very much an absolutely intentionally unfairly designed boss. It's supposed to be overwhelmingly powerful. It's supposed to throw every possible effect at you in an attempt to overwhelm your defenses. And only if you can have an answer to basically all of those things can you prevail in the fight. Very, very much the most challenging thing in Slay the Spire. Very, very much an incredibly difficult opponent. And one that is uh, difficult to come up with any one counter strategy for, no matter the character. Any given heart run is a challenging run, for sure. This boss is so dang hard. And that's not even to mention the elites that you have to fight just to get here. And they're part of the challenge, too. That Spire Spear and Spire Shield. We'll be talking about them in our next... Uh, enemy breakdown video, I imagine, but we're keeping it to the bosses for just this one. That's my breakdown of all the different bosses in Slay the Spire. Hey there, if you enjoyed that video, watch this one next. And before you go, join us on Twitch and watch live. I'm there five days a week playing Slay the Spire, answering questions, and chilling with the community. Click the link in the description to follow right now. Ta-ta for now.